Hi everyone, it's Debra with Let's Get Real About Mental Health. Today we're going to be talking about post-traumatic stress disorder so and complex trusts, post-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> so what is, uh, by definition, post-traumatic stress disorder is witnessing or being involved in what is considered a terrifying event. Um, that it can range for so many things, but that is how they, you can, that's how medical professionals will um will describe it so what kind of stressful events are we talking about we're talking about um abuse physical abuse sexual abuse emotional abuse um being or witnessing a shooting um me personally i have it from my childhood from some neglect uh and uh some comments that were made over a lots of time that were well meant but created a huge issue for me um so it became a part of my complex ptsd um also i had several incidences when i was a paramedic that put my life in danger and those created ptsd also so what you have to remember you guys is that when the event happens initially um, the signs for ptsd might not show up for a month, a year, 10 years, it, it takes a long time for your body to actually be able to um, let you know that you're ready to start dealing with this kind of stuff. Um, and it could be immediate though. You, you could start having these symptoms immediately. So it's really important just to be self-aware. If you have, um, if you experience something like this, be on the lookout for these kinds of symptoms and, you know, uh, let your partners know, your family know uh, what, you know, what they could be looking for. So um, there are four categories of symptoms in PTSD, intrusive memories, avoidance, um, negative changes, and um, physical and emotional reactions. Sorry, you guys, I lost my place. So when we're talking about intrusive memories, that's obviously, you know, it's a memory that's going to be invading your place, your, your, Piece, and it starts to erode your peace of mind. So these will have, you'll have reenactments of the traumatic event. Um, you'll have nightmares or nightmares or dreams about the traumatic event. And they're going to cause some severe emotional um, and physical reactions. Now, when you're having these severe and emotional reactions to this, um, that, for example, like when I have my uh, nightmares, um, I wake up in severe emotional distress. I'm scared out of my mind. I have total anxiety and I even feel like, um, like I could hurt, I have hurt myself sometimes because I move around so much when I'm having these nightmares that I've actually caused bruises and whatnot on my body. So those are some examples of what could happen when you're doing avoidance. Um, avoidance is just what it sounds like. You start avoiding things, things that you associate with the trauma. Um, you know, for example, if you were jogging to 7-Eleven and you are going to stop and get a Gatorade and while you're there, the place got robbed, a, robbed at gunpoint and the guy pointed the gun at you. Okay. You may start avoiding jogging. You definitely start avoiding, um, going to a 7-Eleven because those kinds of things are going to trigger the memories of the event. And it's something that you're not ready to deal with yet. Um, the other thing is you can be avoiding people. Um, if there are certain people in your life that are the abusers, you of course are probably going to avoid them, but people who remind you of the abuser could also be something that you start to avoid. If there's a certain phrase in people's vernacular that, uh, I don't think I said that right. Let's try it again. If they say things, if they use phrases in that, that you associate with the abuser, um, you can start avoiding that person because that triggers a memory of the events that happening happening to you. So we're talking about make negative self-talk, uh, changes in mood. This is where things start to get really dangerous. You guys, um, we start having negative thoughts about my, yourself and the world around you. Um, this is a lot where victim blaming comes into play. Uh, you start blaming yourself for the abuse. You start blaming yourself for, being in that store, uh, you start blaming yourself for, um, you know, if I was for me, if I was, didn't go to work that day, then I wouldn't have been involved in that drive-by shooting and I wouldn't have 
post-traumatic stress over it. That's the kind of things you start thinking. You think you're hopeless. You think the future is going to be as dark and gray as this day is. You know, uh, you have the dreams, you feel horrible, you're dealing with the symptoms, and you just think your whole life is going to be like this for the rest of your life. You're going to be dealing with these kinds of things every day. Um, you're going to start having memory problems. For me, this manifests as a uh, loss of time because something will trigger my memory and I'll kind of get a blank stare and kind of go back into that time and place. And that is also considered a flashback because I'm awake. Um, when you have, um, you go back to that time in that place and you're just zoned out of what's really going on with your life. Um, I'm not talking about days or weeks or anything like that. It can get that bad, but, um, for me, it's only a few minutes. Okay. Um, also you're going to have difficulty maintaining your, your close relationships. And the problem with that is that you're going to be having, um, problems interacting with people because they might be triggering you. You don't know how to interact any longer. Um, you might have a flashback. Unfortunately, that's happened to me. I've had flashbacks and my husband has said something while in the flash, while I was in the flashback and I came out swinging and I hit him so hard and I've never felt so bad, but he, uh, that's what happened when I was disturbed in the flashback. I thought he was my, uh, he was my abuser and I came out swinging because, you know, I'm now of the mind frame that I'm not going to be abused like that ever again. Um, you also are going to start feeling detached from those family and friends because you, if you avoid them or you detach yourself from them, you take away the feelings you have, then you can't be triggered. You can't drag them into your hopelessness. You're trying to really save yourself from the risk of being abused or traumatized again. And then, of course, you're going to start showing lack of interest in, in hobbies that you enjoy. Uh, and what happens with that is that you, again, the hopelessness, you just like, why? Why bother? The world's going to, the world is horrible. This horrible thing happened to me. Why should I even bother to find any joy in anything? Like, you know, I, I used to love to write. I still can't write. To this day, I have a really hard time writing anything. I used to love to do that. And I, I just can't. Um, my art is a way that I get out my expression, my, some of my, um, uh, feelings. And that helps me a lot. Um, the other thing with these negative changes and stuff like that, you, you have to, uh, look at is that we start displaying, um, destructive behaviors. Okay. And those are not, um, they're not good guys. They're not good at all. And by destructive behavior, I mean, things like, um, abusing alcohol abusing drugs, driving too fast, and you know it's dangerous, but you do it anyway. And this it gets really complicated in the things that we do, why we do them. Um, but I'll just give you some examples of what I've learned. Um, I know that when you do alcohol, you drink too much alcohol, you're trying to kill the feelings. You don't want to feel this way anymore. You don't want the anxiety. You don't want the worthlessness. You don't want anything. And the problem with alcohol is that it works initially. Initially, when you get a little buzz, you know, you're happy, you feel good. You may, it's easier to interact with people. But then when the alcohol starts to, you know, you get too intoxicated, it works as a depressant. And you're even more depressed than you were before. And you're starting to feel those feelings more intensely than you did before you took that first drink. So, you know, alcohol might be a, cure in the moment, but in the long run, you're going to be hit by those feelings even harder. The same thing happens with drug use. And I'm not saying don't ever do drugs, don't ever drink alcohol. I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying is that um, you just need to be aware of what's happening and what's going on in your life so that you are, um, sorry, turn on my light there. Now I look like I'm a vampire. Okay, that's better. <laughs> um, you, you just have to be aware that you can't abuse them. You know, you can't have a six pack every single night and expect to not create a dependency on that. Um, the driving fast, taking risky behaviors, that kind of stuff. Well, that in that way, you're dealing with things is that you're doing, um, you're giving yourself an adrenaline bump. Okay, that bump, the adrenaline creates a dopamine reaction in the brain and you feel better. You feel you're excited, you feel a high. And that again is awesome in the moment, but then you have to have, when you have adrenaline letdown and the drop afterwards, you feel even worse. 
you know, you feel sad again, all of your feelings start coming back and it makes it that much more difficult. Um, so, and I, again, I'm not telling you don't drink, don't do drugs, don't drive fast. I am telling you just monitor, you know, and be aware of why you're doing it because it's, um, I know for me, uh, I, I am an alcoholic. I know that. Uh, but I stopped drinking as much because I noticed on the days that I was super sad were the days that I was falling into, let's have a six pack, even maybe more. Um, and that is not healthy. Uh, I really did have to cut down and I have cut down significantly, but I still enjoy a drink. Okay. So that's one thing, you know, you have to just monitor yourself and, and, and be aware of when you're getting into trouble and how much you're drinking, how much you're using drugs, what kind of risky behaviors you're, you're displaying, you know, um, another risky behavior that you can have is, you know, unfortunately, if we're, we're, we were sexually abused as children or sexually abused at all. Um, one of the things that people do is they become very sexually promiscuous, promiscuous. And in these days and times, Pregnancy is not the worst thing that can happen. Okay. You guys, there's so many diseases out there that can really uh, literally ruin and end your life. So, you know, you start displaying that kind of behavior and it's a twisted logic that I don't quite understand, but I'm told that by doing that risk behavior, you actually are kind of re-engaging in the act, but in a way that you control and that gives you a positive feeling. Um, and again, I'm not a therapist or anything like that, but that, that's what I was told by a therapist when we're talking about why people display these behaviors. Um, okay. So when we're talking also, you can be, um, frightened really easy during this time. You know, uh, if somebody comes in my house and I'm not expecting, I didn't hear him come in and they say, hello, that startles me. Um, I'm really easily startled and to sound fight when I hear a car backfire, it's not particularly fun for me. I don't have a really great time on 4th of July uh, because those bring back memories of gunshots. So it makes me, you know, those are the kind of things that you'll see in PTSD patients. Um, you know, you'll have the trouble concentrating, the trouble sleeping. Um, the, uh, the one that really, it hurts me to say it because it, it, it does happen and it's just so sad to me is the overwhelming guilt and shame that you feel when you have PTSD. Um, somehow, some way in our mind, or because we're told that by an abuser could be also that we are responsible for what happened to us. It is our fault. And you start to feel like you're guilty and not only you feel guilty, but you feel shame because you somehow allowed this to happen to you. Uh, and it's, that is just a hard one for me to deal with because I was involved in an abusive relationship and I was told time and time again, it was my fault. If I didn't behave this way, he would not have to strike me. He would not have to tell me I was stupid and ugly and all that stuff. If I would just get in line and do things the way he wanted them done. So, you know, I really had a lot of guilt over that. And then I had the shame of staying in that relationship. You know, I, I was brainwashed to feel like I could not leave because nobody was ever going to love me again. I wasn't good enough. But then I had the guilt of, I stayed. I stayed for years. Uh, it wasn't until I had my daughter that I um, got out of that relationship because that particular person had shoved me while I was holding my daughter and we both went to the ground. And that was my defining moment. I was like, I'll be damned if my daughter ever goes through something like this. But there was that I had to, I had a lot of shame and a lot of guilt over staying as long as I did. Um, with PTSD, when you have a like ongoing trauma, like physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, uh, and it's ongoing for years and years and years, your PTSD is going to be worse. You're going to have some really bad intensity uh, symptoms of PTSD. And that's something, honestly, you guys, you, you have to give yourself a break because PTSD isn't going to solve itself overnight. You really have to work to solve it. And the longer the abuse took on, I think, honestly, the longer you will have to deal with those symptoms and work through them because complex, uh, complex PTSD is no joke. It is like PTSD times 10, you know, cause you have all these different incidences that you're trying to work through. Um, so when do you know if you're going to, uh, when do you know if you need to see a doctor? So, you know, you need to get help. Okay. Anytime during the PTSD process, if you feel like this is something that's going on with you, you should seek medical uh, advice. 
And the reason being is they can put you on medication. I'm on like four meds for my PTSD and that can help you manage your symptoms while you go to therapy and work through, work through and do the work to get at the root cause of the PTSD. And, um, also you guys, when you start to feel, get to the point, um, where you're actually considering doing dangerous behavior so that you will die, your past time to get medical attention. There's a phone number right there on the screen. You call them, they will talk to you. You can text them, they will talk to you. Either way you wanna do it, they will hook you up with um, somewhere to go and get some crisis intervention going on, okay? So, you know, the thing also with PTSD, you have to remember is that when you, um, oh, I lost my place again. I'm so sorry, you guys. So how do you, what do you do when you first, uh, you know, you're like, God, I think this is going on with me. Um, I reached out, I reached out to my husband and I said, there's something wrong with me. Okay. I can laugh about it now because there was something wrong with me. Yes. But I already had been diagnosed with major depressive disorder and anxiety disorder as well as insomnia. So I had those three strikes against me. And then all of a sudden I'm like, the medicine's not touching this. Why am I having these outbursts of anger out of nowhere? Uh, why am I not sleeping even though I'm on medication for it? Why am I waking up screaming? You know, uh, why am I doing this zone thing? Why do I zone off? Where do I go? What am I thinking about that kind of stuff? And I finally just said, I, you know what? I need help. And so we went to my doctor and we started talking and I got a therapist. The thing is with your therapist, you guys, you might have to shop around. You might have to be aware that not all if therapists don't, one doesn't fit all. Okay. You have to find somebody that, um, really fits you. And I'll, I'll share my experiences that I had one therapist that I went to and, um, she was like, okay, you have all this stuff going on. She goes, well, I don't know that you have PTSD. I know you're an alcoholic. Yeah. I know I'm an alcoholic. I figured that out years ago. And she's like, well, you need to stop drinking. Okay. So you guys know that face by now. Um, yeah. Okay. I do need to stop drinking. You're absolutely right. But I don't think that needs to be the main priority of getting my treatment under getting me treatment. Okay. Let's try reducing my alcohol and giving me some other tips to help control my situation help me talk myself through it. So I, I didn't stay long with that therapist at all. I felt, in fact, I felt more traumatized by her judgment than I did get any help from her. So I went to another therapist and yes, indeed, she did tell me you have to stop, you have to drink, stop drinking so much. So we went from drinking six to eight beers a night to let's drink four, you know, or let's drink two, you know, and I really did get there with that, um, with that experience. It took me years. Okay. And, um, I was given lots of very good tools to deal with my PTSD, dealing with my anxiety. Um, you know, I have to recognize when I'm going to have these issues. And when I do, I take what I need to take, I need to do. Um, so also for me, um, with stopping the drinking, I increased my marijuana use. And some of you out there might be going, oh, great. She's trading one drug for another. It's a gateway drug, blah, 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 blah. Okay. If you believe that way and it works for you, that's fantastic. But let's not judge people who need the help, need the assistance of marijuana to deal with some of the stuff going on in their lives. Okay. I have immense pain uh, because of a physical problem in my body. And I also have mental disorders and it, marijuana helps a lot. It helps relieve the pain. It helps take my anxiety and throw it out the window so I can calmly approach what's going on in my life. And for me, it's better to be high and be able to think my way through an anxiety attack and calm myself down than it is to be twisting my ring, curled up in a ball on the floor crying because I can't get a hold of the anxiety. Okay. And that's, and, and that can be started off for me. It's one day it started off from hearing a car backfire. And I just felt that I was back in a situation where we happened to, as paramedics, we happened to drive through the middle of a drive-by shooting. I was scared to death. 
And uh, it, it did, it left a permanent mark on me. So, you know, those things, you have to approach it really with an open mind and you need to start thinking about what works for you. Okay. I'm not saying or advocating it's okay to make excuses for my behavior. Hey, I had this happen to me and that's why I do this so that you just have to deal with it. Um, you know, no, people don't actually have to deal with it. Okay. If they choose to remove themselves from your life, let them go. Okay. If you have people telling you, I, you just need to get over it. Talking about it just makes it worse. You need to get them out of your life. Okay. Because they're not helping you. Um, they're actually trying to make their lives more comfortable because what you're going through is making them uncomfortable. Okay. So you need to get a therapist, talk to somebody, get on some medication. You know, I know someone who doesn't like to take medication. I personally take medication. I take probably about four or five pills for my uh, mental health and I'm progressing very well. I'm doing so much better because I do, I have acknowledged what's going on in my life and I do have, um, I do have a treatment plan that works for me. Okay. And that's the thing, you guys, you have to have a treatment plan that works for you, but you can't say, I'm not going to try. Okay. You have to try to get control of this. Because if you don't, PTSD will eat you alive. Okay, it really will. And you know, I, I, there's a statistic out there that makes me so sad, but 22, 22 veterans each day kill themselves as a complication of PTSD. That's astounding to me that we can't get our military the kind of help that we need to get them. But in our society, we're barely starting to touch the, uh, you know, touch the surface of normalizing mental health uh, conditions and normalizing the acceptance of these conditions and it being okay to go get therapy. The military is so far behind. Um, they don't allow it. They don't, you, it's on your permanent record. They'll show you're depressed. You have these issues, so you can't do certain duties. And I understand restricting it, but you're keeping soldiers from getting help. And that is leading to all those suicides. It is terrible that they are allowed to do that. Um, forgot what else I was going to say. Okay, so let's talk about like um, PTSD that is complicated by other mental health disorders. Okay, as you guys know, I said earlier that I have depression, anxiety, insomnia. I also have, um, like I said, I have the PTSD. So the other things that, that can be complicated or caused by PTSD or can, can be complicated by the PTSD. One of them that I found really fascinating was um, an eating disorder. And I never really thought about it uh, before, but um, I am a comfort eater. Okay. When I get upset, I want to eat and it makes me feel better. But then after I do it, I'm like, I hate myself again. So when I address that issue with my therapist, they're like, yeah, it's all part of the trauma that you experienced as a child. It's coming out. You were told, I was told that I couldn't eat certain things because I was fat when I was a kid. And I was never, I never had a weight problem when I was a kid. Um, but as an adult dealing with that and finding comfort in those foods that I was told I couldn't eat has led to a weight problem. And that's again, another ish, another symptom of my PTSD. Uh, you know, and just, be aware, be aware that these things can happen and they do happen. And, you know, you don't want to adopt the attitude of, well, I have this and people just have to deal with it. I, I can't get better. Well, you're right. People do have to deal with the fact that you have a mental illness. Okay. They do. Those who want to be in your life have to deal with that, but you can't get stuck in the place where you're like, well, I have this and it's never going to get better. I'm just going to have it forever. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to have depression, anxiety, and PTSD probably for the rest of my life, but I work on it. I work on it daily. And that's something that you really have to do. Get your game plan going. You know, um, I'll share an incident of, um, I was having a flashback and I just told you guys this and my husband and I were arguing and he stepped up to be close, get closer to me. And then during this argument, and I, like I said, I flashed back. Uh, and I came out and I hit him. I put holes in the wall, everything. And I, I have no memory of it at all. None. Um, so in our family, we don't raise our voices at people if we're standing because it triggers me. We have our discussions sitting down and from a distance because that actually puts me in a safe place where I'm open to have these discussions. 
And uh, that's what it's kind of stuff I'm talking about that you need to realize and really look at and say, hey, this is what I need to do to start working on this kind of stuff. All right, you guys, that's all I have for PTSD and complex PTSD. Please uh, like and subscribe. And if you have any questions, please send them in. I'll be happy to address them. Any uh, thoughts on what we should do for the next show, that would be great. All right, y'all, have a good day, night, and always be kind to yourself.